Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about cars and us, our relationship with cars. But why do we care about car ownership and use? Does it actually matter? Or is it just an excuse for a vendetta against drivers? I want to argue that, yes, it does matter. And no, it's not about being anti-car. But collectively and individually, I do believe that we need to change the way that we travel and break some of the dependency we currently have on cars. I was watching for um, some preparation a Ted Robbins presentation. don't know whether you've seen it, but a quote of his stuck in my mind. He said, in life, lots of, lots of people know what to do, but few people actually do what they know. Knowing's not enough. It's about action. So tonight, I'm just going to share with you some experience from London that we've had in trying to turn what we know into some action. London's growing. By 2031, we expect there to be a million more people in the city, all wanting to travel, travel to work, to visit friends, go shopping. And we're going to be in trouble if those people travel in the same way that they do now in terms of space, in terms of emissions, in terms of congestion, in terms of the quality of life in our city. We've done some forecasts which suggest that even if the car ownership per household remains the same, so the rate of car ownership stays the same, with a population growth, we could have half a million more cars in the city by 2025. Meanwhile, we've got a target to reduce CO2 emissions by 60% from 1990 levels. Unfortunately, since 1990, our CO2 emissions from transport have remained constant, with CO2 efficiency and increased travel demand pretty much increasing at the same rate. Road transport is also responsible for PM10 emissions, so the harmful air pollution emissions that get in your, in your kind of throat, your children's, kind of, they cause children's asthma, all sorts of problems. Um, and even though we have made some progress in this sphere, um, we still have over 4,000 premature deaths in London alone each year from air pollution. So at Transport for London, we've been doing a programme of research into car ownership and use, looking at causes and consequences um, of car use and the propensity towards change fundamentally believe that we can't or shouldn't really even try to change something unless we understand it. This is the FISH model that's as a result of that, and it's simply called the FISH model just because of its shape. Nothing more exciting, I'm afraid. Um, but it basically highlights that car use and ownership isn't just about need. Attitude, social norms, perception, cost, um, all sorts of factors, habit and inertia, come into play. We think that there are about six steps to car dependency, i.e. when people believe that it's impossible to manage without owning and using a car. Um, and we did a lot of surveys in our research, and basically just about everyone believed that it's a right people's right to own a car. And while, not every, while, while people acknowledged, most car drivers acknowledged that not everyone did need to drive or own a car, um, they didn't accept that they didn't need to. Um, just 2% saw their car as a luxury. Um, even in many parts of London, where we've got fantastic public transport, many people aspire to car ownership. And how many of us can honestly say, those of us who own or drive a car, that we think really hard and really kind of question the way we use it or our decisions around that car and how we travel? Car dependency, I don't think, is inevitable. But we do know that we will probably need to use every single tool at our disposal to promote change and really encourage people to make different choices. We also know that some of the tools we've got are more politically saleable or acceptable, while others, which may be somewhat more effective, haven't proved very popular, at least to date. 
We know that the answer has to include a lot of different options. For those people who have the choice of whether to own a car or not, can we encourage more people to choose not to? But we've also got to recognise, as other speakers have said, that lots of people will continue to need to use a car. So for those people, can we encourage them to drive less? Can we encourage them to the different models of car ownership that we heard about earlier, to cleaner cars? And even when they drive, can we encourage them to drive more efficiently? We've been running a campaign in London um, to try to encourage people just to make a few small changes about the way they drive in order to reduce emissions. Um, it's been a focus on no idling, so turning off your engine when you stop. We wanted to make the link between people leaving their engine on and the health impacts of the um, emissions. We know that reducing pollution levels can alleviate illnesses such as asthma, um, heart and lung conditions. So we gave people a simple thing that they could do, an action that they could easily take. And we've seen from the first phase of the campaign, idling reduced by approximately 5%, or that's what our surveys indicate. But campaigns like this can also raise some challenges in terms of how do we persuade people to take the issue seriously versus the perception that we're using scare tactics? And also, do we risk some perverse consequences if people get too scared of air pollution and the effects to walk or cycle? We've also been helping people to switch to electric vehicles. Um, in places like outer London where there's fewer alternatives, it's a real step forward with cleaner cars. But cleaner technology isn't the whole solution. We um, have, have seen evidence of potential bounce back where people, because they think they've got a cleaner car, can actually drive it more or increase emissions in other spheres of their life. Um, and also, however clean the cars get, they still cause congestion and severance in our cities. So can we share cars more? We've heard about some, some examples of, of how we can do that. And there's evidence that suggests that for every car club vehicle, 20 private vehicles are taken off the road. And in London, 30% of um, members who joined didn't buy the car they were intending to before they kind of, uh, when, when they joined the car club. We've also been encouraging people to get on their bikes in the nicest possible sense. And um, every day in London, People get in their cars to make half a million journeys of under one kilometre. Those journeys are eminently cyclable. So what we've done is combine um, journey data, so trip data on trip lengths and purpose, with market segmentation to understand where there might be the most potential to influence people to switch to cycling and use that to guide our policy making. We've also used some hard demand management measures in London. Many of you will be familiar with the congestion charge, which was introduced back in 2003. As a result, there are far fewer cars driving in central London, about 70,000 fewer cars every day. Um, what we know is that the reduction in cars has been pretty stable um, since the introduction. We also know that half the people who were facing the full charge payment switched um, their, their kind of mode or their time of travel, while eight in ten people who had the charge paid for by somebody else or were entitled to the discount chose to stay and pay. And most of those people didn't think about alternatives for their most recent trip when we asked them. But we have seen a return to pre-charge levels of congestion and speeds. And we've been looking at the reasons for this, and we've dubbed our conclusions the bent, the bent spoon hypothesis. This is another one that's because of the shape of the graph. Um, th there's a theme there, isn't there? I think we ought to get a bit more, bit more exciting about how we name things. But basically, this plots um, the traffic, observed traffic levels against average speeds. And the basic point to take from this is that it reflects, what we can infer from it is a reduction in the effective road capacity in central London. So the demand effect of congestion charging is still working, but we've had falling speeds and increasing congestion, and that's got to be as a result of reduced capacity. And that's as a result of very deliberate policies around increasing cycling, road safety measures, and urban realm improvements. But what it does is it makes it a difficult sell to explain to people what's happening. So charge payers who are still paying the charge don't perceive themselves getting the benefits. 
And while congestion would be much worse, the counterfactual is actually a really difficult sell for people. And the term congestion charging itself increasingly belies the wider benefits that we're capturing from the scheme. Most of you, I'm sure, will be aware of the recent Olympics that we held um, down in London. Um, we had a lot of focus on encouraging people to walk or cycle, remode, retime their journeys to try to alleviate some of the pressures on their transport system. And for regular travellers, we had something called Get Ahead of the Games program, which told people about the busiest times and places on the network and the alternatives available. And it proved very successful. A third of Londoners reported changing their weekday daily travel patterns. And we had observed data like 62% more um, cyclists in, in East London and 158% more pedestrians. So we've been thanking people for the changes they made. But I wonder whether the implication of that is that it's just over. Well, at Transport for London, we're working with people up here um, and in many research areas to try to capture all the data we've got and the experience from the games and actually try to turn it into a lasting legacy of behaviour change. This is where I get a bit more personal and go off um, TFL policy. These are my personal views for the, for the last few minutes of the talk. Um, but for new development, we've really got a blank sheet of paper, or more of a blank sheet of paper, in terms of influencing travel patterns. And there are big areas of London that are being redeveloped at the moment, which offer really big opportunities for change, and to embed more sustainable travel choices, and a new vision for mobility and growth, moving away from the current model of individualised car ownership, um, and streets dominated by vehicular traffic. In Europe in the 1990s, car-free development emerged as a mechanism to try to enable people to live more easily without a car and tackle some of the transport problems and traffic problems that they faced. And in many cases, cars are only allowed into the residential streets at walking pace and only to load or unload, not to park. There is often some separated parking available, but it is away from the residences, so many people opt to walk or cycle for shorter trips. In London, though, I did my dissertation um, last year. I got time off from TfL to go and do a master's in planning. And for my dissertation, I looked at car-free development in London, and I found that it was a much, much narrower concept. What it, how, how policymakers and planners and developers defined it was simply as new development with no parking. And frankly, I wasn't surprised that it hasn't proved very popular because it's not that marketable or attractive potentially. Developers may find it harder to sell their homes when their residents won't be able to have a car, but they also won't get any of the benefits from giving up their car, like streets that children can play in or better air quality, because of the focus on, on just on parking. So what I figured out also was that car-free is quite an off-putting term for a lot of people. And we actually probably don't mean that anyway, because we don't want to get rid of cars entirely. We just want to lighten the dependence on them and promote alternatives and really facilitate kind of different journeys. So I coined the phrase car light, um, taking from kind of healthier foods and, and things that still taste good, but are good for you. Um, and I believe that if we can genuinely make developments that offer those types of environments, they can be, they can be saleable and not just niche. But currently, lots of other factors get in the way from being able to promote this, not least the real political focus at the moment on building more homes very quickly. And extra policies or complications are just seen as unnecessary or diverting attention or resources and potentially putting off the private sector. And the politics of parking in particular are hugely sensitive. But in areas like East London, regeneration and economic activity are allied with increased trip rates. And at the moment, that's currently assumed to come with increasing car ownership and use. But the big question is whether we can still get the increased economic and social activity, but without the car dependence. I actually believe that we can, and there are a few encouraging signs that suggest this. For a start, um, second car ownership is probably more amenable to change because people perceive less of an impact on quality of life. 
Also, when we actually find that people have to give up their cars for some reason, they're forced to, most of them don't actually find it as bad as they thought, and they don't always revert to previous behaviours. Another factor that we've heard is that young people, some of them in London that we've talked to, they no longer see the car as particularly appealing because of the cost, the hassle of parking, aggressive drivers or attitudes or perception of quality of life. But that's a real change in that cohort that we can build on. And I'd like to think that, that change is achievable, and we've, we've seen it in, in central... In, no, in London as a whole, actually traffic levels peaked in 1999 and have been falling since. We don't fully understand all the reasons for this, but we're looking into it. But I wonder whether it could genuinely signal a potential change in our relationship with cars. Thank you.